In two decades as the Washington Post food critic, Tom Sietsema has eaten more than 9,000 meals from restaurants around the city and the world. He's seen it all. But you won't see his face. Tom eats anonymously, so he won't receive special treatment from chefs wanting a good review. Today, we have him in disguise, and he's ready to dish for Washington Post subscribers. I'm Washington Post food video editor Mary Beth Albright. Join me as we celebrate Tom's 20th anniversary as the Post food critic. We're having lunch with Tom, live. Hello, we are indeed live from the Washington Post Food Lab with Tom Sietsema, who has been our food critic for 20 years, or as he sometimes put it, the hired mouth. The hired mouth. <laughs> the hired mouth and the hired stomach and everything else. Um, and we asked Post subscribers to send in questions for Tom, and they answered with hundreds of questions. I love that. Yes, so well, let's get started. Bring with the it first on, question. please. Um, have there been ever been any restaurants that earned Michelin stars that you disagreed with? This is from Sandra, and it's not a softball, so go ahead. Oh, wow, start with the hard ones, yes, huh? Yes, right. Look, I think anyone who gets recognition, you know, ought to be happy about that. Yes, there is one that comes to mind. There is a, do I have to name this restaurant? Yes. I guess so. Plume in the Jefferson Hotel. To me, it feels a little, it's a beautiful room, don't get me wrong, and the food is precise, but I don't think it's necessarily really interesting or innovative. I get the, I get the sense it's a little dated, mm -hmm. actually, and it's fussy, formal food when uh, you might want something uh, a little more creative. So this is interesting because Michelin just came to Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. a couple sure. of years ago. How do you feel like they're doing? Well, you know, honestly, I, I feel like um, great. It's acknowledging uh, uh, ours as, a, as an important food city. Hello. They're also a, uh, known for manufacturing tires, and they want to be close <laughs> to the corridors of power. So Washington makes sense in that, in that way in, from a business sense. I don't think that they necessarily put the, the, the resources into it uh, that uh, some of the local media do, uh, certainly including the Washington Post. Oh, we do put our resources into this. We do put our resources uh, because into this, you do, absolutely. And, and that gets to the next question, <clears throat> which is from Allison, which is, what is your average, average dining and reviewing experience like most days? Walk us through the uh -huh. process of deciding what restaurant to review, dining there, interviewing the chef and owner, and drafting a review. And I will add putting in the photographs, because the photographs are beautiful with your pieces. Sure, sure. Well, my editor, Joe Yonan, does that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Joe. Uh, but here, here, here's what happens. I, I have a, a sort of a master chart. I buy these old calendars, and I sort of plot out where I'm going to be eating uh, on any given month pretty far in advance. Not always, but what I'll do is I'll wake up, I, I like to juggle restaurants. I'll be working on maybe five different restaurants in different stages. I always visit restaurants at least three times for a formal starred review in the, in the magazine. I'll go once or twice for First Bite, which is my preview column that runs in the food section on Wednesday. And it, you know, I vary it up. I like to have one night off too. If someplace opens suddenly or, or, or whatever, I like to have a night where I'm a little flexible. Mm -hmm. If I need to go back to a restaurant that I'm not quite sure about, uh, the Washington Post gives me the flexibility to go a fourth or a fifth time if need be. You know, every restaurant's a little different. I do go at least three times, however, for, uh, for a starred review in the magazine. And you go anonymously. I do, I, I mean, anonymously, I never make a reservation in my name. Uh, so if somebody is doing that, and people have done that in the past, uh, aside from my brother who used to live in the Washington area, and call restaurants with dates on a Friday night and get in at 8 o'clock at some of the hot restaurants, please don't do that to me. Um, you, you know, I, yeah, I, I do try and go as anonymously as possible, and I have different names that I use and different open table accounts and all sorts of things. To, try and keep at least one or two steps ahead of restaurants. They, they, they do find out what your names are and they have to change those up and, and kill pseudonyms now and then, which I love doing, you know, cutting oh, sure. up the credit card or whatever. Well, yeah. how do you, get, I mean, how do you get fake credit cards? Oh, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. Um, yeah, it got a little tougher after 9-11, I will say, <laughs> you know, but um, if you have friends who work for banks or if you always pay your credit card bills on time, it's not a problem. It's almost as if I'm a little company and I have all these people working for me 
you know? Yeah. And as long as, uh, you, you know, the bills are paid, there, there, there aren't too many questions asked. Tom Sitsuma, Inc. Yeah, there um, you go. Okay, well, we have an, a video question sure. that was submitted internationally. It's from Jose in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> Bad Hello, Jose? dear Tom. Um, so I guess uh, big day today, and more having you in these amazing live chats. And, and I don't know uh, of the many, 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 many questions I would love to ask you as a chef. <laughs> One question is: How many stars do you give yourself when you cook at home? That's the question. <laughs> and anyway, thank you for everything you've done these last 20 years, Tom. Uh, you were you were a great following to the great Phyllis Richmond. And Washington DC has been great having you guiding all of us into how to make this city a great city one dish at a time. So a big announcement today. World Central Kitchen reached one million meals in Bahamas. So I wanted to share that with all our Washington family that they support us so much. Bye. Okay, so. Oh my gosh, I love that. Thank you, thank you for what you did to make the, the, the city a better place to dine in, but also the world a better place to live in. Jose, awesome. I mean, and there's a lot to unpack there because Jose just announced that they served a million meals I think in the Bahamas. Fabulous. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing at World Central Kitchen. Um, so, yes, he wanted to send something in. So, the question is how many stars do you give yourself when you cook at home? What's in your fridge? What, oh, wow. All, all those questions. These <clears throat> well, are the behind the scenes. Okay, time okay, questions. sure. Um, I, I frequently photograph. Uh, when I get a little bored at home, I'll, I'll photograph my refrigerator and Instagram it or something. <laughs> it's more a water cooler and a wine cooler than anything else. <laughs> um, the one meal I can control a day is breakfast. So I usually have blueberries or apples or something, fresh fruit to eat with oatmeal. It sounds really boring. But, you know, I can't eat three restaurant meals a day or I'd be even bigger than I am right now, right? But I don't keep a lot in my refrigerator, actually. And um, unless it's like dining guide time and I'm eating a lot of good food and you open it up and there are all these like little, little cartons in there like, ooh, what do I have for a little midnight snack? You know, Del Mar or Haleo or Rasika or whatever, you know. I need to have a little freshness states on those cartons too because sometimes I, I forget about them and they're lodged in the nether regions of the refrigerator. Yeah, and, it, and it's funny because um, somebody wrote in, do you ever get doggy bags? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Frequently what I'll do is I'll, I'll send them home with, uh, I'll, I'll send leftovers home with friends. I'm a Minnesota kid and uh, I used to be a member of the Clean Plate Club, okay. so I hate throwing things away. What I like to do is uh, send food home with friends. Frequently, I don't eat it, but um, I will send it home with friends, sure. I hate to waste food. Well, we have a second video um, question that, we, that was submitted. It's by Phyllis in Washington, D.C. Oh my goodness, <laughs> love her, love her. Hey Tom, happy anniversary. I'm delighted that you made it to 20 years. I know it's not been easy. I think you have a few more years in front of you, maybe countless years. This is a job that you have to devote every bit of your body to and every bit of your mind to. That's also what makes it exciting. You've given it 20 great years, and you could give it another 20 if you really wanted to. So I think, the, first of all, that was Phyllis Richmond, who was our food critic for 23 years, and your boss. She was my boss for at least four and a half years. And boy, was she um, a wonderful role model for what I do now. I really got a chance to learn from the very best right from the get-go, right out of the gate, you know. Um, I, um, she was hard, she was tough. If she gave you a compliment, wow, I would print them out. I would actually print them out from the printer because, you know, she was not free and easy with that. But she was so good at what she did. And so I had that template to work for, which I, I'm, I'm really grateful for, actually, because you start at the post working for the best and then, you know, you, you, you learn and take that with you as you go and develop on your own, too. Well, it's funny because a lot of people submitted the question, how do you become a food critic? Sure. What is your background? And especially now, because in the past 20 years, you've seen Yelp come you and you've seen Top Chef start. And so it's been, a, it's been a lot of food happenings over the 20 years. So people have asked that. How do you become a food critic? What's your expertise? 
that kind of thing. What's your background? Sure. I, I don't think anyone sets out at the age of you know 15 or 16, I want to be a food critic. Well, maybe they do yep, now, they do but now. like <laughs> in my generation, they certainly didn't. I had a, a great background in that my family was one that really cared deeply about eating well. We lived in a, I come from a small uh, farm town, uh, Worthington, Minnesota, about 10,000 people. Um, my mom was a fabulous home cook. She also worked full time. She was a public health nurse and she worked full time, but she came home during her half hour lunch break every day, um, put together a meal and we would sit down and eat dinner every night at 5.30. And that is, that, that, that is such a great way to start out life you know, to have that. So there's always this great enthusiasm around food and food that was wholesome and good for you. She was a 70s mom, so we had one, two, three Jello and, and, and things like, and pudding <laughs> yeah. cakes and things like that. But she made a lot from scratch. I mean, donuts, uh, when we had birthday parties, she would make them into dinner parties for, for kids multi-courses wow. and she made this thing called a world's fair cake which is many layers of different flavors of whipped cream and everything but make the buttermilk chocolate cake from scratch and everything so she's a very from scratch kind of cook so there was that when we would um when we would go to minneapolis to go shopping or something we'd always eat the nanking and we thought it was this fabulous exotic food now you would never say that right but um my, my parents had a great enthusiasm both for traveling and for eating well on the road so that was always from the get-go. And I used to read Phyllis in college. I went to the school of foreign service at Georgetown. I, I read her. So to actually work for her one day was just a, like a dream, right? And how it happened, I took an English class at Georgetown. Um, my, my professor took a shining to me and he said, hey, if I can ever help, help you out, let me know. He worked at the Washington Post for Bob Woodward. He was an investigative reporter. and. I got a call one day. I was slinging pizzas at Pizzeria Uno. That's what I was doing in, in college in Georgetown. Oh gosh, I, yeah. On, on the crossroads of uh, Wisconsin M there. And he said, hey, there's an opening for uh, a copy aid position. And copy aids, um, uh, you, you know, it's sort of grunt work and you, you change toner and you deliver papers and you answer phone calls and things like that. Um, and you will do anything to get out of those jobs because you want to write or report or, or whatever it is. And um, so I got that job and I did that little, uh, you know, uh, the little process. And while I was at the post sorting mail and answering phone calls, you would apply for any job that became open. Like, oh, the weather editor needs somebody, the sports editor needs an assistant. Well, I remember one point after I'd been there about six months, Phyllis Richman, the legendary Phyllis Richman, uh, who was both food editor and restaurant critic, was looking for an assistant. And um, as was Bob Woodward. And I applied, uh, I interviewed with both, and I got a very nice thanks, but no thanks from Bob Woodward. <laughs> Do you want to laugh about that now? I laugh about it. When I see him <laughs> at parties or whatever, I'm so glad you didn't hire me. I'm so <laughs> glad you didn't hire me. My life would be so different. Um, but Phyllis hired me, and um, one of my jobs was to uh, test the bulk of the recipes for the food section. So for the first four years I was at the Post as her assistant, um, I was testing recipes both for the Wednesday and the Sunday food section that oh, we had back then. Oh, it was twice a week. Twice a week, yeah. right. I was making no money, but I was going home and cleaning squid and making African peanut stew and, and old colonial cakes and all sorts of things. Um, she would go to, to England to write a story about Stilton cheese and come back with a Stilton cheese cookbook and, and tell me to, you know, test 10 recipes out of there. So I got God, a real sense. I can't sense. imagine what your kitchen smelled like. Wow, well, it was great because I had great pots and pans and ingredients. And, and again, I think my, my weekly grocery bill was probably um, double, triple what my monthly rent was at the time, right? Um, but I learned how to cook. You know, they figured, um, you know, I didn't have any you know, professional training or anything like that. I did take the occasional class, but I, I certainly didn't go to culinary school. I think what's really important uh, as you move along is, um, you know, you do want to understand food. You, you do want to understand how ingredients go together and everything. Um, but that all takes money too, you mm -hmm. know? You want those building blocks. And I didn't have the money to eat out, but I would tag along with her on, on different reviews. She was very generous uh, with me on that. And um, slowly I got to, uh, she trusted me so I could scout restaurants for her to see if they were worthy of being reviewed by the magazine. And at the time we also had suburban reviews as well. So I wrote for the District Weekly, it was called. Oh yeah. And I did a little column for that every week. So, you know, you start small and, and, and build up. 
And that's really your education. It's an education of Tom Sietzema. Yeah, it was just, and then obviously I moved along to, to different newspapers and I had this career path that took me to the West Coast and, and, and back to the heartland and everything. Um, but really it was, it was a matter of learning from the best in the business, um, learning um, how to get your facts right, how to fact check something, how to cook. Um, how to deal with uh, tough customers, all of that. And I would take all her phone calls. So I was, I was right there, you know, um, sort of the gatekeeper. Always be nice to the gatekeepers, by the way. Just saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you're totally right. Um, and this is interesting because I don't know if you see a different way that you, I have been fortunate enough to dine out with you. Yeah, um, And it is a very, um, you know, you don't, you don't talk a lot about the food during right. the meal. And sure. so do you find that there's a different way that Phyllis did it? That, of course there is, but how are you different from Phyllis, do you find, well, after I think, dining out with her? You know, she covered her era so well. You know, it, it, it was a different scene then. And, and, um, but she was always very adventurous, too. She, she, she didn't want this steady diet of like high-end dining, and, and neither do I. You know, I yeah. think um, she was very good at ferreting out uh, bargain restaurants, more casual restaurants too. And that's the way she liked to eat. I mean, she had this lofty position, right? But, but uh, like, she, she was also th this woman who really appreciated a good crab cake or a good burger or a good hot dog or street food. And I always appreciated that about her. You know, she, she, she liked food from A to Z and was very open to all sorts of different cuisines. Well, we've gotten a lot of questions about that, about your star system mm -hmm. and whether you rate Mom, some people would call it mom and pop restaurants or right. lower price or whatever, mm -hmm. whether you rate them on the same scale as fine dining. Like, what is a four star experience at a burger joint versus a four star experience at a high end white tablecloth restaurant? So, sure. a lot of people wanted to know about sure. that. Sure, yeah. What I do when I, when I go, like, review, say, uh, an Ethiopian restaurant or a French restaurant or a Chinese restaurant, what I'm doing is comparing all the other Chinese or Ethiopian or French restaurants in my experience against one another. You know, so people say, oh, stars, you know, some people love stars, some people hate stars. I brought them, I introduced them to the post, Phyllis didn't use them, but I think they're important in that they, they, they force a critic to be more honest about the way he or she feels. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you can't um, be wishy-washy about something, you have to come down. And I think when you're looking at it that way, when you're comparing apples to apples, um, it, it's much easier and I think it makes more sense. And I would, I would have no problem giving four stars to a great hot dog stand. I think that's possible. Yeah. You know, I just haven't found that yet. Yeah. In right. D.C. or anywhere? Anywhere. Yeah, for, yeah, start, for right. sure. Yeah. Okay, so Nancy wants to know what happens if you really dislike a particular style of food? Um, how can you effectively criticize it? And, and um, somebody named S, just S. Just S. Um, which is great. Um, wants to know more and more people have food mm -hmm. intolerances and allergies. So how do you deal with that with the people that you dine out with? Or is it sure. sort of the... One person called it the Danny Meyer, the restaurateur Danny Meyer, who you know wants to be all of service to whoever it is. So, how do you deal with that? How do you rate restaurants on that basis? Well, one thing I, I do think it's important to eat out with a variety of people, and I do. I go out with people who are much older, uh, much younger. I go out with uh, people from all up and down the economic spectrum. Um, I, I like to, you know, I'm around this all the time, and you don't want to get um, you don't want to get jaded. And I think by by including other people, including people, I have friends who are vegans, I have friends who are lactose intolerant, I have, you know, so I'm eating out with these people on a regular basis too, and I see how restaurants respond to them, you know. And then of course, I hear from readers, I get hundreds of emails a week from people who uh, share their dining experience at, at restaurants around the world. Oh, really. sure. Yeah. Well, lots of, I yeah. mean, journalism has just become like a dialogue. It and, sure has, and, you and I love that dialogue. Yeah? Yeah, that's my. And what, so what do you think is the role of people sending you comments? I mean, is that something, when somebody sends you a comment about a restaurant, do you keep an eye out for it? Do you, they had a bad experience, let's Sure, say. you know, I always, you know, we're trained to be skeptical in this business, so I always want to know if this person is coming with an agenda. You know, are they friends with a competitor? Do they have an ax to grind with a chef? Yeah. Do they, um, you know, and, and um, 
I guess the more detail people give me about a specific problem, the better, the more seriously I take it. If they just say, oh, I don't like that restaurant. Well, why don't you like that restaurant? What in particular yeah. bothered you? Was it the service? Was it the comfort level? Was it the noise? Was it, you know, whatever. So people, um, people get my respect if they're more specific about a problem and they can articulate exactly how they might disagree with me or my assessment or something like that. Yeah, and, and, and because you're out so much and because you're you know, responding to people's emails and stuff like that, you eat out how many times a week? At least 10, at least 10, every yeah. night for dinner, almost every night for dinner, and then um, brunches or lunches uh, throughout the week. So Leslie wants to know, first of all, she wrote, hi, Tom, which hi. I thought was hi, lovely. Leslie. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> hi, Leslie. Um, yeah. Is food still exciting to you as when you first started, or has it become a chore? So this is the sort of like, is there a cap on human pleasure <laughs> question, sure, sure. Um, where you're just like, I can't, I can't do it anymore. No, no. And I think the day that happens is the day that I hang it up or you know, you know retire my taste buds or something. because. I, I think you have to have a, a real passion for what you do. You can't take yourself too seriously either. And, and the thing is, like, I'm not, it's not like I'm eating, you know, unless I'm doing a roundup or something like that, I'm not eating 13 straight uh, Indian meals or 13 straight burger joints or, or, or anything like that. I really mix it up. And I'm also mixing it up with, with the people that I take along with me too. So every day is a different conversation, a different venue. You know, I would no more want a steady diet of three or four star dining than, you know, I think people have this illusion like, oh, you only like, you know, fancy places or something. And that is so far from the truth. Yeah. I love it when, um, you know, I can, I can um, slum it, so to speak, you know. <laughs> um, Kathleen just commented, there, there's a comment section running, okay. and Kathleen commented that she loves that you recipe tested, and it makes her respect you even more. Oh. That you have that really solid background in food, right. you know, and that's what food journalism is, is that sure. you have a solid background in food, and maybe your reference bucket is big enough to include recipe testing, but all these other things. Sure, I think it's hugely important. And just getting back to an earlier question, I think Jose asked it about how I would rate my food? Yeah, give it a start. Well, you know what? I would say right now at this juncture, um, one and a half to two stars. One and a half to two stars. Because I'm a little out of practice. You know, I might have like six or seven dinner parties a year and then I'm all in on that. But on a regular basis, I'm not doing a lot of cooking. <laughs> right, of course. I, I think it's like a foreign yeah. language. I really do. Yeah. And I think you have to practice. And once you have those building blocks, I mean, I can still make a stock or an, or an omelet or something like that. But, but boy, like if you and if you don't have the larder and the pantry and everything ready to go, it seems like more of a chore. But right now, I, I think I would have to give myself a one and a half to two stars um, review on, on my own cooking. Well, that's interesting because people always say like, oh, I'm not a good cook. And it's like, no, well, when's the last time you did cook? Right. And it sounds right. like you're a weekend warrior right now, which I also respect. Right. That you're still throwing dinner parties, even though I've never been invited. Just saying. Um, okay. <laughs> now. Um, so some food, this is a, a question from Anne. She says, mm -hmm. some food critics have started considering allegations of sexual or other misconduct against chefs and restaurateurs and deciding to, whether to review their restaurants. Um, so how do you feel about that? Well, I think it's, you know, uh, I, I think it's important to address those things. And uh, certainly the Washington Post, uh, m my colleagues, Moore Judkiss and Emily Heil and, and others have been um, on this, uh, you know, as it, as it surfaces and everything. Um, I, uh, I would certainly address that issue if there was a restaurant right now where I knew that there was harassment and I, I thought that there was an issue and I thought it needed to be reviewed too. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would shy away from that. Um, are there any restaurants, speaking of people who might have um, been embroiled in problems, um, are there any restaurants that closed that you miss in the past 20 years? Oh, wow. That closed. Yes, Palena. I think we all love Palena in Cleveland Park, and that space is still vacant. I can't believe it. But Frank Ruda and Ann Amernick were two of the finest chefs. That roast chicken, uh, her caramels. Uh, and Aggie Chen, too, and, at the end. Right, yeah, right. after Ann Amernick. They, Absolutely. They were, they were terrific, all of them, and I, I really missed that. He, Frank Ruda, was a former White House chef who uh, um, opened Palena, and you know, his, a few of his dishes were, were benchmarks 
for, for every other chef in the city and, and certainly for me. His, his burger, his roast chicken, um, they were both fabulous. And I can't wait to see what he, do, what he does now. Um, he's working for Ashok Bajaj at the Knights, Knightsbridge uh, Restaurant Group. And um, it looks as if he's going to be in place pretty soon at a forthcoming restaurant. And I very much look forward to eating his food again. He's a fabulous chef. Well, of course, there's a lawsuit against him, too. To yeah. stop him from cooking at that restaurant, that's for a different live stream. Um, what do you think is the most exciting food city internationally other than Washington? Oh, wow. You can say America and you can say internationally. Yeah, I, I really think this country right now, I mean, um, the United States. Um, in Europe, I would say um, I learn the most when I go to Spain. It's not France so much. Um, it's not Italy so much. Italy is grounded in the basics. They, they um, I mean, it, it's harder to get a bad meal in Italy than it is in, in France right now, I think. And in Spain, I keep learning so much. And in Spain, I can see where Jose Andres, among other chefs, have gotten their, um, you know, ha have developed themselves and yeah. uh, developed a style of cooking. Uh, I call it avant-garde or nouvelle uh, novel. Uh, cooking um, that is really spectacular and is being copied all over the world. I also like, um, I love Indian food. Um, What's your favorite Indian place in D.C.? Oh, wow. Well, um, there are so many now. There, yeah. there are a lot that have opened. Uh, I think Punjab Grill is doing a good job. Of course, uh, Rasika and Rasika West End. Rasika West End being the sexier of the two. Rasika being sort of the standard bearer. Um, I love the, 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 um, the tradition at uh, Bombay Club. Um, I think Karma Modern Indian does a good job, mm -hmm. you know, and then smaller places around the area too. You know, we're, we're, we're in a good time for Indian food right now. Um, people want to know how much you tip. This is from Kurt. How much do you tip uh -huh. and what do you base it on? And I think this is a particularly interesting question. Michelle Singletary, our colleague, sure. and Tim Carmen, also our colleague, just did a piece about right how tipping should not be based on service because it's so now into what, how people live. Ingrained. Right, so that's what Kurt wants to know. Okay, well I tip 20%. If the service is really bad, I might tip 15% though, and so I might disagree with other people there. Um, I, th I think you should not reward people for uh, inferior service. It should not be automatic. But by and large, I mean, when I'm on the clock, I tip 20%, I tip it on the total bill for the most part. It's few extra dollars. Plus, I have to say, having been a waiter before and worked in restaurants, mm -hmm. um, people in the hospitality business tend to tip a little bit more or be a little more generous. And like it or not, 20% is, is the new norm. Yeah. Um, we got a lot of these kinds of questions that are, what, how do I behave in a restaurant? Sure. Right? Um, and one person wants to know, and this is more about your particular situation in a restaurant, mm -hmm. what is the strangest, if you do get recognized by a chef or an owner or a waiter when you walk into the restaurant, mm -hmm. what is the strangest upgrade you've ever received? Because people want to give you free food when you walk in, right? And you can't take it because right. it's, you're an unbiased reviewer. I mean, this is something we haven't talked about, is in the rise of social media and everything, there are a lot of people who go and get free meals. You are not one of them. Yeah. Specifically, that's why you go in disguise. So there's an ethical basis to it. So, but I know that sometimes people might know, like figure out who you are or whatever, and they want to send you a ton of food. What is the strangest thing? Which things always backfires happen? because like sometimes I don't want that food necessarily or I've had that food already, you know. So um, I always like it when, when restaurants treat you just like any other guest, you know. Um, I have shown up uh, a few minutes late when my party's been seated and all of a sudden magically the table with the, 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 the water view opens up. <laughs> um, most recently I was at a restaurant uh, right downtown DC and we had a bumpy table, you know, and they couldn't fix it. They couldn't slip a little napkin in or something under this bumpy table <laughs> in the patio. And so they moved us uh, two feet away to another table, like less than three feet away. And um, out came this bottle of champagne. Like the real deal. Like, oh, we are so inconvenienced having to have, move, you know, uh, a few inches away, you know? And I said, no, no, we really can't do that. And, like and they said, oh, like, oh you know, okay, so it went back. Around. But then out came the charcuterie board. And I was like, <laughs> like, like, how many times am I gonna have to refuse this? And just, you know, so I actually wrote about it, you, you, you know? Yes. And, um, and, 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 and that's, 
you know, uh, this can backfire this, this um, sometimes service, more service is just more service, you know, mm -hmm. and it can be annoying. And there's nothing worse than um, being out with a group of people and um, the helicopter waiters and managers and everything come around. What's really funny, I know that I've been recognized or spotted. Um, waiters will do this pivot in the middle of the dining room. They'll, they'll look over at you, they'll do this pivot. And all of a sudden, a parade of people walk by you, like, get a good look, you know? So you feel a little bit like the, <laughs> the animals in the zoo, you know? You're, you're, you're watching all this. Um, but, you know, really, I, I do appreciate it when people just treat you as they would any other uh, guest who's, who's looking forward to good food and a, a, a good meal. If you are recognized, do you calibrate that particular meal for yeah. that? Or? Yeah, of course. I mean, sometimes it's so over the top, and, and sometimes even if they know you, they can't, <laughs> you, you know, right. it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Like, I know that there are places where my picture is hanging in the back, but they still, um, this is another funny thing that happens is is like I'll get a waiter who's kind of a, you know goofy or inexperienced and all of a sudden the general manager will be waiting on us or you know there's that old switcheroo that happens yes. you know and I think oh just just let this other person wait on us we're, we're having a fine time here you know you don't need to do that when I was interviewing Phyllis yesterday I was talking to her about um, one time in 1979 she reviewed discos Oh, sure. Literally yeah. discos. The, the word, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask you if you're going to do that. But she did tell me that one time the restaurant actually went out and brought in dessert from another restaurant oh, that's to hilarious. serve her. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, if you're that bad, you should probably not be in business. But what happens a lot of time, too, is like they'll be out of a dish. Like, like if the fish isn't that fresh or they don't really like something. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We're out of that tonight. Oh. You know. That's tricky. But then I've seen it on other tables. It's like, oh, how does that happen? <laughs> and they came in after we did. How does that happen? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of a cat and mouse game. You, you know, I realize that. Um, you know, I sometimes will look at people in a restaurant and I will know that they know that I know that, you, you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And you just, you know, I'm, I have the advantage, too, in going multiple times. And um, even if I'm known to a restaurant, I might not always be known um, on all three or four visits. Or um, I have little, little ways of getting in and out of restaurants without being detected, other than a disguise. You know, I'm not going to reveal them here for everyone to find out. <laughs> but, but you know, and, and also hearing from readers. And I have a lot of friends who are food enthusiasts, obviously, who who fill me in on like, yeah, you know, I had a real issue with this restaurant the other night. You, you know, and and so I have eyes and ears and readers and friends and people who are passionate about what I do. So I feel like I'm getting this steady stream of information. Too. It's not just me. Well, this has been an amazing behind the scenes look at Tom Sietzema, 20 years, the Washington Post food critic. And we're so grateful for this today. Thank you for being live on camera with us. This is, as I said, the first time. Um, so I'm Mary Beth Albright at the Washington Post and the Food Lab. Thank you to all of our subscribers who have submitted questions. We couldn't do this work without you. Absolutely. And bring you, the, yeah, bring you these unbiased restaurant criticisms and the behind the scenes look. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.